This is the first video in a multi-part series where we're going to talk about best practices with logging, and we're going to demonstrate it via Spring Boot. First of all, why log? We want to log because we want to have an understanding of production issues that might have gone wrong in the past. This is one of those things that you don't always get in school. A lot of times you learn how to write good programs, but the reality is, in our industry, we spend a lot of time hunting down defects and looking at problems in production. And being good and efficient at doing that is a skill that's very highly valued, probably even more highly valued than being able to write code. So we want to make sure that we're using logging because logging gives us the breadcrumbs that we need to go back and investigate an issue. So some best practices. Number one, use logging levels appropriately. When you're logging, you can log things at different levels, from trace to debug to info to warn, all the way up to error, and you can even define some custom logging levels. It's important that you're logging at the right level. In other words, something that's a common occurrence that's normal and expected should not be logged as an error, where an error should not be logged as info, because we'll use those severity levels to help us sift through logs and find out what's actually important and what might have caused an issue. Now, sifting through logs is an important skill. An error will not be logged very frequently, hopefully, in your application, but a trace and a debug might be very verbose. So you hear about a needle in a haystack, you might be looking through a huge log file just to look for a couple of errors. You can do that, but another approach is to have a general log file that logs everything, and then a more specific log file that only logs what is severe. That can help you to narrow down an issue without having to search through a humongous set of files. If you have a try-catch block or an exception, you should always have a log statement in there, even if you don't think so, even if you don't think you need it. An exception could occur at any time, and you want to be able to see where this exception has occurred. An empty catch block without a log message is throwing away some very important information. A final thought is that if we do have an exception, we don't want to display that exception to the user as it is. So if we have something like a null pointer exception, you don't want to have a message box that says, null point or exception, because number one, the user doesn't understand what that means, and that's just confusing and intimidating. Number two, maybe the user does know what it means because maybe you have a user who's trying to hack into your system and is trying to figure out as much as he or she can about your system, and the more exception logging you give that user, uh, the more information you're arming that user with. So the log levels that I mentioned earlier, error, warn, info, debug, and trace, these are some common log levels that we'll have, along with log levels that you can define yourself. So error, you should only use that if an error actually occurred, something like a catch block. Warn is something that isn't necessarily an error, but just doesn't smell right. Something like getting zero results from a search might be a warn. Info is kind of an everyday occurrence, something like, okay, this user has logged in, we might log that at info. Debug, we're getting to a much more granular level here because this is something we're typically only going to turn on when we're in development mode and we want to look at steps through our application. That is one nice thing about logging is that we can filter by these levels. So we can say only show me info and greater, which is common in production. But in development mode, we might say show me everything, which would be trace all the way up to error. So trace is a very fine grain level uh, where you're essentially looking at entry and exit points. So in Spring Boot logging, it gives us some logging capabilities by default with a dependency called Spring-JCL. The nice thing is this is already included with some other dependencies, including Spring Boot Starter Web or Spring Boot Starter Logging. In our application, we're using Spring Boot Starter Web, so we don't need to import anything extra to get our logging. Now, by default, we can use these logs, but they will log to the console. So when you start a Spring Boot application in Eclipse, you'll see this information come up in the console tab that you're probably familiar with by this point. You might want to log to a separate file or multiple files, and that's where we're going to need to have a configuration file. To get a logger with Spring Boot, we simply say logger log equals logger factory get logger, and then we have to provide it the class which is producing the logs, because that will appear in the log output if we wanted to. Then to actually log something, we'll say log.debug if we want to log it at debug level, log.info, log.error, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at a hands-on example with Spring Boot. Let's start with our controller class. Loggerfactory.getLogger. Alt-Enter to import. Now we get some funny red lines, but 
we actually resolve those as soon as we assign this to a variable. So let's say it logger log equals logger factory dot get logger. And then again, I'll enter to import that logger class. Let's take a look at this delete mapping endpoint because we can try a lot of our different log statements here. When we enter the method, we can have a log debug. Debug is really meant just for development purposes, so it's anticipated that you're going to have a lot of these statements, but you're not going to need them in production. So we wouldn't want to write something to a file, which is essentially what we're doing here. Every time we enter a method, because that's going to add a lot of overhead to that method and slow it down. That's where debug is good. Now, info might be good here after we've deleted something so that we can go back in history if there was an issue and we can see when this was deleted. Now we go down to the exception and we see something might be wrong here, so let's go ahead and add a log.error. So you can see this one's a little bit more complicated because we have a bit of text here and then we're showing the ID of the specimen we're trying to delete. Then we give it a message and that message comes straight from the exception that appeared in this catch block. Then we attach that exception as the second parameter, which is an optional parameter for our method call right here. So a debug, an info, and an error all together. We could add a couple more debugs, but we get the idea of what's going on. We'll grab a few samples here. We see there's a specimen ID 43, 45, 47, 49. That gives us a couple ideas. Now I come back to our delete endpoint, let's say 49. Now I received a 500 internal server error, which I actually was not expecting, but this is great because this is exactly when we want to see the value that logging statements give us. First, we have to know where to look. We want to look in our console by default because that's where logging statements go by default, unless we specify another destination. When we're running from IntelliJ IDEA, the console is this thing down at the bottom. If we're running from command line, it could be a command line window. But the reality is that's going to be really hard to search through log information, especially if you're trying to retroactively solve something that happened days ago. You'd have to scroll and scroll and scroll. So we will eventually use something called logback to publish this out to a destination. But in the meantime, we know that we can take a look here in our console and we can look for our log messages. First of all, you'll notice the severity level here in this column, info and warn. Notice there are no debugs, even though we put a debug in. Well, that's because this console only shows priority info and greater. It doesn't show debug. And there again, debug tends to be used for developers, not so much when we're in production. So when we look at how to publish these out to external files, we can look at how we could publish debug to one file and error to another. But nonetheless, let's get down and see why we got a 500. If we come down here, we'll see error, unable to delete specimen with ID 49, and then message, could not, and it's great anticipation, could not execute SQL, nested exception is hibernate exception, constraint violation exception. And then it goes on to tell us a little bit about a foreign key. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look a couple lines up, you'll see that foreign key information. Oh man, this is exactly what I needed to know. The reason why it won't delete is if I take a look at the specimen, we remember that we have specimen 49, which is one that I just chose at random. But now take a look at the photos table. If we look at the photos table, we see one of our photos is associated to that specimen ID 49. And if you remember when we did our Spring JPA, we had uh, several areas where we mapped our specimens as the one side of an equation and the photos is the many side of the equation. So it looked at that and it said, oh, okay, in that case, you can't delete the one side unless you delete the many side first. And if you try to delete the one side without deleting the many side, then I'm going to give you an error. Okay, sure. So we can go in and manually delete this related photo down here in the photos table. And normally we would script that, but I just want to demo how to make this work. I'm going to look in the foreign key column to make sure I don't have any other specimen IDs that are attached to that specimen number 49. And then I'm going to go back and run this one more time without even restarting the application. Provided the application still running, we're in good shape. I hit send. And this time, take a look. We get back a 200. Now let's take a look at our console. 
This error is from that previous round, so don't worry. It's, oh, I see an error. Don't worry, it's from our previous round. Now let's look at our console, and we see a different log message. Again, one that I created. Info, specimen with ID 49 was deleted. So again, back to our controller, and let's take a look at the two, cons the two log messages we've seen so far. Specimen with ID blank was deleted and unable to delete specimen with ID and then message. So we unintentionally saw this one, which I wanted to show anyway. Then we saw how to fix it to get this one. And we know that debug will not show because the console is set up to only show info and greater. And that's one of the nice things about logging is you can give logging messages different priorities and you can use that to focus where those log messages end up going. So when you're looking for a log message, you don't get distracted by things that are not related. So this has been a quick look at logging in Spring Boot. Stay tuned for the next video where we look at where to put these log messages. I hope this video has been helpful, and as always, I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.